So in the first video, we took some of our VMs that were running in Overt and we imported them into just to live that running on a Fedora server. So we can see those VMs that we imported here. We went through and we did some editing of the um, network interfaces. There's just some clarifications I wanted to make on those. So if we take a look at our VMs that are running and we edit, for example, this one. And we go down to interface. So in the first one, what we did was we actually tagged these interfaces with the VLAN tag from Open vSwitch. So there's a better way to do that because what will happen is when we reboot this VM, it'll create a new interface that won't be tagged. So what we can do is just go in here and add a VLAN section. And we do tag ID equals and then the VLAN we want to tag it with. And then we can close our VLAN section. So now when, when that VM is rebooted, it will tag that port in Open vSwitch automatically. So we won't have to go in here and do anything. So we can see they're all tagged there. So in the video today, what I wanted to do is I want to deploy an OKD environment. So if you're familiar with some other videos I've made around OpenShift, you know that OKD is the upstream version of Red Hat OpenShift container platform. So to do that, we're going to go to our virtual machines and we're just going to create the virtual machines we need and we're going to manually provision them from the ignition file. So we're doing the bare metal install that I'll link in the in the description below. And we're going to manually boot from Fedora Core, Core OS from some ignition files. So to start with, let's head over to our terminal. Now what we want to do is we've got the installation program here. So we just downloaded that following the documentation. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to determine which version of CoreOS. So if you just download the very latest version of Fedora CoreOS, Core it's not going to work. This needs to work with a specific version of Fedora CoreOS. So there is a way to determine that. And that is like this. So what we're going to do is run OpenShift install CoreOS print stream JSON. And then we're just going to look for the formats of disks that we can use. Now, in our case, we want to do a metal deployment, so bare metal. So these are the images that we can choose from. So if we just wanted to download the ISO, for example, and then attach the ISO to some VMs, this is the ISO here that we could download. So we could improve on this a little by doing ISO disk location. And then that gives us a location, and then we can just simply curl that. So we could do curl dash o, and that will download that ISO, and then we can attach that to our VMs, put from the ISO, and then write the CoreOS image to a disk that we choose. So in my case, I've already done that. That's already on our server. We don't need to do that. But you can see here, this is actually Fedora 34, whereas the latest available is Fedora 35. So that's why it's important to know that this exists. So we can go back to here, and we'll go to valid with the images. And you can see that I've downloaded quite a few things here, but one of them is that Fedora Core OS 34 ISO. So what we want to do then is we want to create some virtual machines. Now I've gone ahead and created all the disks that I'm going to use for this. So because I've created those QCAR disks, we're just going to import those. So we will do OK. Uh, OCP dash ETL plane zero dot okd four dot dna dash shift. Now these are following my DNS schema for my domain. These you can name them whatever you want. I live with that images. Okay, so we go down and we can see that I've got one here called Control Plane Zero already. So we'll use that one. This will be Fedora Core OS stable. And because it's going to be one of our control plane nodes, we're going to give it 16 gigabytes of RAM. And we don't want to start it immediately. There's still some network configuration we need to do, and we need to attach that ISO so that we have something to vote from. So we will just import that as a VM for now. And we're going to do our bootstrap node as well. So this is only a temporary node. It doesn't need to be here permanently. So after the deployment, we might reprovision this one as one of the worker nodes for the OpenShift environment. 
images and I've already got a bootstrap one here. Chorus. Now the bootstrap node will just give it 8 gig of RAM and we don't want to start it immediately either. I will be quiet and just fast forward through the rest of these while we create them. Okay, now we've created and defined our VMs, we just want to go through and edit those network interfaces. So we'll go here, Versh list, oh, we can see that they're all listed here now, Versh, edit. So again, we just want to find our interfaces section. Now these are all going to be on VLAN 4 as well, so we'll do network interface type will be a bridge, the source bridge will be VR cloud again. I will leave the model type as vert.io, this is another thing I didn't do in the first video, but we want to leave that as vert.io, otherwise the performance will be fairly bad. We'll add in our VLAN tag again. Close that off. And then we just want to add virtual port type equals open v switch. And we want to take this MAC address. This MAC address is going to be important. We need to set that up in our DHCP server. So in my case, that's running in PFSense. So we're going to go to our DHCP server. This is our infra environment. CDHCP is enabled. We scroll all the way down here. Now, what I might do is I've already set these up before, so I might just change the MAC address of that VM. But if you do, if you can't do that, then what you would need to do is go through and create some static mappings for the MAC addresses that are shown here. In my case, I will just quickly edit that. BF29, BF29, yes, that's right. So we can save that one. That's our first one done. We'll do our control plane. And again, I will just fast forward through this. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to create an install config file. So we have a look in install config. So this is what an install config file looks like. And if you have a pull secret, then you would also add your pull secret here. So we basically go through and we're defining our domain, which is the domain I've given to those about VMs we created. I'm not going to define any worker nodes. We're just going to do three control plane nodes here. So we set our master to three and worker to zero. Now the metadata, that's going to be like the dot and then base domain. So we'll have anything dot ok4.bne-shift.net. And then our cluster network is this is all internal to the OpenShift environment. And I'm going to use the network type of OVN Kubernetes. And this is the SSH key from the system I'm using. So what we want to do then is just create an install directory. So in my case, shift already exists and we copy in our install config into that directory. Now we want to run open openshift install create manifest and then pass it in our directory which is being in shift that will create our installation manifest and then we want our ignition files. Ignition. Uh, ignition config, sorry. So now in that directory, 
we have the bootstrap master and worker node ignition files. We have an auth directory which will have our kube config file and the kube admin password. So what we want to do now is we want to send those ignition files over to our web server. So we do SCP and we're going to send them in my case to this node which will be my web server for this environment. So we'll send them to the master ignition file first. We want to send the bootstrap one and we'll send the worker one. So now if we curl So we can see there that we get back the ignition file that will be used for our, our worker nodes. So now we go back to our cockpit console and we want to go back to our virtual machines and we're going to start this bootstrap one up first. So let's click on this one. Now we want to add a disk to it and we want to use a custom path which will be var live live uh, images and then the Fedora Core OS ISO that we downloaded before. Then we click on boot order and we just want to make sure we boot from that ISO. And then we can click run. So here we can see we're booting into CoreOS. Now, if you've set this up right, this VM should get an IP address on your network provided from your DHCP server. If not, then we need to go back and address that and fix that before we proceed. So in my case, you can see at the top there, we have EMP1S0 has an IP address. We can see it there. That's great, that's what we need. So the next thing we need to do is run sudo fdisk minus l to see the disks that we have and we can see that we have bda and sda so in my case i want to use bda so we'll do sudo coreos installer and then install and the device we want to install to so in this case bda we want to do ignition url now this is where we pass in that web server so http colon colon http core and this will be our bootstrap, so we boot from the bootstrap ignition file. Now I didn't do the checksum component that's mentioned in the documentation, you can do that. In my case, I will need to pass in insecure ignition because I'm not providing a checksum. Now that will go out and download that ignition file, as you can see, and it's now installing CoreOS on those disks. So there's a few things you can do here if you had multiple networks and you could configure that. There's an advanced configuration component of the documentation, but in my case, they're just VMs. They just have one interface. There's nothing really that I need to do, but you could do RAGE, you could do bonds, you can do whatever you need to do using the ignition file format. So once this is finished, we need to detach the ISO, change the boot order back to the um, QCOUT image and then reboot this node which will start the bootstrap process and then we can go through and configure our three control plane nodes. So you can see it booting from the disk here now, which is what we want. Great, so that's our bootstrap node up. So if we go back to now, we should be able to SH to that now.
there we go, we're able to use our key to authenticate with that node. So let's just start this running so we can keep an eye on that as this deployment goes. So now we need to configure our three control plane nodes. So we'll start with control plane zero, same process, we need to attach the disk. And then we need to change the boot order. And we will boot that node. So if we go back to our terminal here and we do OVS via CTL show. We can see there's no interfaces being created that aren't tagged as four, which is what we want. So that VLAN tag that we added to the, the XML file is working. So same thing here, we can see it's got an IP address. We know, again, it's going to be dev VDA because we're using the Vert.io driver for our disk. So we'll do core OS installer install dev VDA ignition URL. And then now we want the master ignition file. So that's deploying now and that will reboot and it's just going to keep looping and trying to connect to the machine config endpoint that runs on the bootstrap node and that will actually be the thing that provisions this node in the end and that comes from the manifest that we created earlier. So for that to work you need to have done the prerequisites in the documentation and configured the load balancer which I've done in this environment. I have a HAProxy VM that is HAProxying and load balancing that connection. So I've just added the bootstrap node and the, the control plane nodes into the same back end and that way we'll be able to provision worker nodes if we want in the end. So that's done now. We can reboot this one and see what it means by and see what I mean when I say it's just going to keep looping. So we'll remove the disk. Put the um, so here we should just see it looping, trying to reach out to that machine config endpoint. So there it is there, we can see that it's just continually trying to get that now, which is exactly what we want. That's going to keep going until the bootstrap node gets to a point where it's managed to create that machine config endpoint. So let's keep going with our other control plane nodes in the meantime. Okay, our final one is provisioning. So let's go check on our other two to see. Yep, so they're still doing the same thing. So we go back to our bootstrap and we can see that it's going through and slowly creating those manifests for us. So you can see there it created the master machine config pool. So we go back to our desktop here. And we just export that kub config file. And we do oc get co. Might not be ready to respond yet. Okay, that's our three control plane nodes done. See, it doesn't look like the API is quite ready to respond yet. So what you can do is just run Open shift install. Uh, give it the directory you have used as your install directory and then wait for space bootstrap complete. And now we can sit here and watch basically what you would normally watch if you were doing an IPI install where it provisions all the infrastructure for you.
So that will come up as soon as the bootstrap node is ready to serve that API endpoint. So basically the API comes up on the bootstrap node, it will provision the machine config endpoint, which will provision our control plane nodes, and then control will be handed over to the control plane nodes once they're up and running and ready. And then the bootstrap node can be safely shut down at that point. So I missed the start of it, but we can see here that this node has now been rebooted and it has come up with an IP address. So this is actually running now. So it's not looping through and trying to hit that machine config endpoint anymore. It has now been provisioned. So if we go back to our console, we can see that we're still creating some manifests. If we go back to this one, we can see the Kubernetes API is now up and it's waiting for the bootstrapping process to complete. So we do OC get CO now, we should be able to see some cluster operators created and OC get nodes, we might be a bit too early, yeah we're a bit too early to actually see the nodes registered yet, but we will see those nodes start appearing there soon. So again I'm just going to stop the video and I'll come back once something else happens. Okay, let's take another look at this now. So we see get nodes. So we can see there we've got three master nodes. They're all up and ready now. And we do OC get CO. We can see our cluster operators have all started up. There's still a few things here that haven't finished yet. And there's a couple of errors that I wanted to point out. <coughs> And there's a couple of errors too around the SSL certificate, so I'll need to dig into why this certificate isn't valid for the um, domain I've created. But overall, I'm pretty happy that this is now up and running. So I just realized while I'm editing this that I never come back to answer that question about why the SSL certificate wasn't valid. So we take a look at the HA proxy config. We can see these are all the backends that I have set up. So down here, so for this OCP ingress router, what I was doing was I was sending all of this traffic to port 6443 instead of 443. So the problem with that is that it ends up hitting the, the API endpoint instead of the ingress router. And that's why I was getting the cell certificate is not valid for um, so yeah, once I changed that restart of HA proxy, that problem went away. So that's the clarification for that error. Back to video. And if we have a look at the pods that are running, and we get rid of the, we'll see if there's any crash loop back off pods or any that are still creating. I've just rebooted one of the control plane nodes, so we might have some that are restarting. So we've still got a few that are starting back up there again now. So the next thing we can do, so we can see, for example, the ingress controller is in a degraded state. Now I don't have any worker nodes in this environment. So the next thing I want to do is I want to add a worker node and I want to add that bootstrap node as an additional worker node as well. So let's go back to cockpit. I'll go to VMs. Okay, we'll just we'll shut down the bootstrap node for now because its job's done. What we might do is import VM because I already have disks for these as well. Uh, worker zero forward minutes. So we we'll use this disk and select CoreOS again. We'll just give this one 8 giga param. So again, we'll just quickly edit the network interfaces. Again, we can see there that it has received the IP address that we wanted it to have. So I might just DD this disk because this one's had some other stuff on it. So input file dev zero dev VDA this equals So I'm just removing the partition table on the disk. I'm not DDing zeros to the entire disk. But that should be enough.
Okay, so we can see that we've deadied the disk, so there should be no partition table here now. We do F disk minus L Z V A. Yep, that's great, just a hundred gig disk. So let's do the install. Core OS install R install dev VDA. Now this time we want to use the worker node ignition file. So worker.ign and insecure ignition. Missing some dashes there. Okay, so now we'll just reboot that one. And we'll go back here, I'll remove the disk. Oh, this one. And we can run it. So now this node will connect to the machine config server running on the three control plane nodes rather than the bootstrap node. So we can go back to our terminal and do OC get machine config. And we can see that we have the information for the workers there. So it will boot from those and be provisioned accordingly. Yep, so it's already been provisioned and now added as a, a worker node. So it's getting downloading all the containers and everything that it needs to join the cluster and start serving as that worker node. So let's provision our bootstrap node as the second worker. So a couple of things here. We want to, again, boot from the ISO. But I'm going to rename it. We'll call it worker1. One. Worker1, one. rename. Change a couple of things about this one. So we're just going to leave it with two vCPUs and eight gig of RAM. There's not much that I want to run at this point, but we might start to scale that up in the future. So the other thing we want to do here is just change the MAC address. So we go get the MAC address for worker one. Um, looks like I haven't done a worker one yet. So let's add a new one then. And we'll edit the MAC address and change this to 30. Okay, so we just go in here, we add the MAC address. The IP address will be at 46, which is the next chronological IP address from the cluster we're deploying. We'll give it OCP worker 1, and the domain name will be OKD4 being e shift net. So then we can go save and apply changes. Now, for here, we want to save this now that we've changed the MAC address and make sure it's top of our boot order and then we can boot it. So we'll just clear out the disk on this one again, remove the petition table because it had the bootstrap node on there, don't want anything remnant to get in the way. Then we will reprovision this one as the second worker node and then we will just sit back and wait for them to join the cluster. Our, our working node is not there yet. So, you know, we'll just get cluster upgrades again. So this is starting to clean up a little bit. We can see this looks better. So we can see that we've got no crash look back off um, pods or any kind of issues within the environment, which is great. We just need to wait for these nodes to join. You can see that that one is now up as OCP worker one. So if we just log into one of them, we can watch what's now happening in the environment. Log into the one we added first because it's probably going to be further along. So we've got no messages from Kubelet there, so we've just rebooted. So what, what's happening there is it's applying the revisions of the machine config to the node, and the node's going to reboot several times during that process and then it will come back up on the same image and the same version of the RPM OS tree that the rest of the environment is running, and then the node will be joined to the cluster. So we should be able to get back into that one again in a minute, and we will check the logs again. So once something interesting starts to happen there, we will come back to the video. Okay, so we can see here that Kubelet is now starting to do things, so it hasn't found itself 
just yet, but it's starting to provision things now and things are starting to move along. So we've got at least a cryo socket that we connect to now. Uh, no containers running just yet until Kubelet has joined the cluster. So let's go back here. So we might see that node not ready. No, not yet. So we can see here in this screen now we have some um, certificate signing requests that need approving. So we can approve those. So now we have approved all of those. We can do OC get nodes. So we'll see if that starts to get things moving along. Uh, okay, we have another one there pending and we can see this new one is now pending for worker zero. So let's approve that one as well. Might need to do this a couple of times, I'd say we'll get a few ticket signing requests here. So they're all approved, all approved, all approved. Okay, that's great. Get nodes. Now we can see the worker node has joined the, the Kubernetes cluster. So it's starting to serve some of those containers now to move into the ready status. So we SSH back into it. So there we go, we can see it's now complaining because the CNI hasn't started on the node. So the CNI will be provisioned and then this machine will be ready to start hosting nodes. Now I'd say the other worker node is going to need us to sign the CSRs as well. So we'll have to keep an eye out for these ticket signing requests from worker one as well. Okay, so we have a new kubelet here pending approval and the machine config operator is waiting on approval as well. So we'll approve those. And then we should see another one come up pending for the worker one node. Okay, there it is. So now we can see that we have a pending certificate signing request for worker one. So we'll approve that one. Now we have worker one there as well. So now we're just gonna sit back, wait for the cluster to be fully provisioned, and we will see if our router goes into a non-degraded state. Then I will look into the certificate issue for the um, authentication cluster operator. And then the final thing we will do in the next video is start to move some of the applications from the vanilla Kubernetes cluster into the OpenShift one. And then we might set up OpenShift virtualization on the server and move the Kubernetes cluster into OpenShift virtualization. So I'll pause the video, wait for these nodes to be provisioned, and then we'll wrap it up. So we can see there that the um, pods are starting to come up on that node now. So we've got container creating for quite a few of them there. This um, OVN kube node is the one that is going to be most important because that will be the CNI up and running. And worker one, worker one's in a similar situation. Okay, so if we do OC get nodes now, we can see they're ready. And if we check the pods running on worker zero, we can see there's still a couple starting, but most importantly, that OVN kube node has one has started now and the same for worker one so they are in the cluster so i'll leave part two of this video there in the next one i will be moving some applications from my kubernetes cluster into openshift and then possibly setting up what was my openstack compute node as an openshift virtualization node and we'll move some of the kubernetes vms into openshift virtualization and then we will redeploy triple O all in VM. So we'll have the director operator running in OpenShift. We'll provision a controller node and a couple of compute nodes. And we might give them enough RAM to actually run VMs this time. And then we will run that deployment and provision our OpenStack environment again. And as part of that, I'm going to need to move some VMs that I use for work out of the OpenStack compute node before I can do that. So they will need to be migrated over to this hypervisor, but I'm gonna to need to shut down VMs first. So what we'll do is we'll get the Kubernetes applications all running in OpenShift, 
will shut down a couple of the Kubernetes nodes, even if it's just two of the control plane nodes. And then we will move the two VMs that I have running that are really important to me on OpenStack over into Fedora. And then we can reprovision that server. So that will be part three and probably part four of the videos I'm making here. So it's been a couple of days now, but I wanted to make sure that I could articulate the problems I was having and how I resolved them. So you saw in the, in the last video, I was having an issue with the machine config operator and it was staying in that degraded state. And that stayed in the degraded state for the next couple of days. So the problem there was to do with the rendered config and the difference between the bootstrap node and the deployed in cluster machine config operator. So let's take a look at that issue now and I will do my best to explain how I troubleshooted the issue and how I ultimately resolved it. So we can see all the cluster operators have now been deployed and that includes the machine config operator as well. So the problem I was having was if we looked at the machine config pools, the master pool, it was, it was never proceeding. It was just always staying in a degraded state and it had zero machines that were ready. So what happens when we do the bootstrap process is we run one copy of the machine config operator on the bootstrap node. And then when the bootstrap node is ready to provision the masters, the masters run a separate copy of the machine config operator on the master nodes. So the problem with that is that the two can't speak to each other. And if there's any differences between what the bootstrap node is doing from the installer and what the machine config operator is doing from the objects that are actually in the cluster, we end up in a situation where there's a different config expected and the master nodes aren't running that expected config. So the issue I had is actually related to this problem here. So there is a discussion um, going on about the problem on, on GitHub and there was a patch for it here. So basically just these kernel args were different between what the installer was creating and what the machine config operator was creating in in the actual in cluster deployed machine config operator and that difference led to the problem so to fix that issue what we need to do is just take a look at our nodes and if we have a look at one of our control plane nodes in the details and the annotations there's these annotations here that tell it which machine config has been deployed so you've got this rendered master um, so this, this is probably easier to see in my terminal actually, so we go here. So if we have a look at the annotations that are here for this node, you can see that we have the current config and desired config and they equal this 6664D1. So if we take a look back in our console, machine config calls, we see here that matches the configuration that's been rendered there and if we have a look in machine config, and go down this 664, so that is this one here. So that's the one that it should be. So the problem was I only had this master one and this worker one, I didn't have this one. And that's what the actual master nodes were actually running. That's what was deployed by the bootstrap node. So to fix that issue, what I did was, if we go here, bring up the terminal. So we have a look at this MCS machine config content JSON. So that file is actually the machine config, the rendered machine config that is running on the node. Now, as I said, mine was one that didn't actually exist in OpenShift. So it didn't exist here. So to fix the issue, we see our root to host from the terminal. We can do this from the, from, the, um, from the console, that's fine. And we just want to SCP that file, SCP MCS just to a system that we can work with. So this is the desktop PC that I'm recording this on. So now that has been sent to my desktop PC. So we go back to my terminal. So we can see that it now exists there. So if we edit that file, we can see it has a name up here. So what we want to do is make sure that the name matches the one that it's complaining about it saying that it can't find. In this case, it would, so I don't need to change anything. And then we just can do an OC create dash F on that file. Now I'm not going to do it because I've already fixed my cluster, but once that has been created, that machine config will exist. 
So you can see that it exists here. And you can see it's only 44 hours old, whereas the others were two days old. So that is the one that we had to add to fix this cluster. And once we've done that, the cluster had come up. We can see that it's all deployed. Get cluster version. Everything is fine, and now I can perform upgrades and do various various activities from here. So that's probably the end for part two. I've just gone ahead and I've deployed some uh, some of the pods, so the Unify pod, for example. I've moved Unify over. I've given it its persistent volumes. It's now up and running. I've migrated all of my network equipment over to actually speak to this Unify controller instead of the Kubernetes one. So in part three, we will go ahead and migrate the rest of our apps over, shut down some of our Kubernetes nodes, and we will move the VMs that I use for work off of the OpenStack compute node onto the Fedora hypervisor, and then reprovision that hypervisor, hopefully, as a OpenShift working node.